I've got coffee, you've got questions, let's do this thing. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Well, let's dive right on into it. First question comes from William. William asks, love the show. Wanted to know your thoughts on accessories on bolt guns such as backup sights, night vision, lasers, anti-cant devices, bubbles, levels, lions, tigers, bears, oh my. How much is too much? Thanks again for all the info. Well, William, the how much is too much is a pretty simple uh, evaluation. If the gear that you're strapping on your rifle no longer assists in accomplishing the mission at hand and begins to detract from accomplishing that mission, you've gone beyond that how much is too much point. Uh, anything that you strap on your gun should promote the firing task. It should promote placing lead on target. Um, if it doesn't, then it really doesn't belong there. Um, when you are setting up a bolt gun for precision rifle work, for long range shooting, uh, you really need to look at it and decide, okay, what do I need to accomplish the task? Uh, some of the stuff you listed, like night vision, uh, for, certain ni for certain missions, night vision is critical. Um, if you're going out and you're doing, uh, say, hog hunting in the middle of the night, uh, night vision is a great aid. Uh, if you are shooting a tactical rifle match during the day, obviously a night vision device is not going to be a good thing. Uh, backup iron sights are almost completely useless on a bolt action rifle, uh, mainly because you're going to have to do some kind of rail system out front to be able to put the sights on so that you have a large enough sight radius to be useful. Uh, usually you're not going to kick that optic off and have the sights already zeroed. Uh, rifles like the Accuracy International uh, AW, they have, or even the uh, AE Mark II, have options for backup iron sights, but they really aren't as useful as they would first appear. Uh, it would almost be better just to get you a dot sight and zero it with a quick release mount and throw that in your ruck. That way if you ever did have a failure of your primary optic, you can ditch it, slap that dot sight on, and you can drive on with a one power sight. Uh, these uh, offset red dot sights, if you're running a certain situation like a tactical match where you'll have to engage very far precision targets and then transition to very close targets, then that may be an option. If it's not, if you're not going to be doing that kind of shooting, then all you've done is added another piece, some more weight, uh, something else to make your bolt gun more cumbersome. So just strapping stuff on for the sake of strapping stuff on is not a good thing. If you have a problem and there is a specific piece of gear that you believe will help you solve that problem, then by all means throw it on there and try it out. But ask yourself why you're doing it. Uh, is it just another line so when you brag about your build you can say, hey, I got this, 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 and this? Or is it actually filling a role uh, in your shooting? So that's the way I like to look at it. Uh, sometimes I go a little bit overboard on some stuff, but uh, things like uh, ACIs can be very useful if you're shooting down off of a building or shooting down off of a mountain, that kind of thing. Um, I tend to really not use the bubble levels, but some guys find them very useful. So it just really, if it does something for you, that's good to go. If it's not, if it's just eye candy, then maybe think about leaving it off. Kendall asks, to crimp or not to crimp? I don't crimp any of my precision rifle ammunition. Um, what we are generally trying to prevent by crimping bullets is what's called setback, and that's when recoil or the simple act of chambering a cartridge pushes the bullet back into the cartridge case. Uh, crimping will you know, prevent that by smashing down the mouth of your case, but let's think about this. When we're doing precision rifle work, we take a lot of care to make sure that those cases are concentric, 
that we have the same amount of release pressure from case to case to case, the same amount of neck tension on each one of those cases, so that the bullet releases the exact same from one case to another. It would be kind of silly to go to all that effort and then throw it in a die that's going to crush that mouth back down around that bullet. So I do not recommend crimping on precision rifle ammunition. Now if it's blasting ammo that you're going to run through an AR and you're going to keep it in an ammo can for six decades, uh, go ahead, seal it, crimp it, do all that fun stuff to it. Uh, I don't believe that it is going to assist you a whole lot versus just proper neck tension, but that's up to you. I think mainly the crimping thing has come from duty ammunition that's going to be handled very roughly and military requirements. But for precision rifle ammo, I've never seen a need to do it, even in my gas guns. I will usually set the neck tension to be about two thousandths, and the way you do that is as you're going through loading your ammunition, measure the outside diameter of your case neck prior to seating a bullet. Then measure that diameter again after you've seated the bullet and measure the, or take the difference between the two. So for mine, the case neck is 2,000 smaller before I seat the bullet than after. Now if you're not getting enough uh, case tension, say you're only getting you know, 1 thousandths or maybe almost no change at all, then depending upon your die you can change that. You may be able to get a smaller uh, expander ball, a smaller mandrel, or in the case of the Lee dies that I use when I'm using the neck sizing die, I can take that mandrel out and spin it in a drill with some sandpaper and polish it down a little bit. It doesn't take a whole lot, we're only looking for a couple thousands, but polish it down to get a little bit more tension on that bullet. Now if I was running a gun and I started to see that I was getting bullet setback by chambering a bullet a couple of times or leaving a bullet in the bottom of the magazine for a couple of magazines and then checking the length on it, if I started to see it, that bullet is getting pushed back into that case, then I might go back and set up a die for that rifle and run a tighter neck tension on it just to give it a little bit better grip on that bullet. But overall, I do not crimp any of my precision rifle ammunition. Charles asks, how would you rate the 800 to 1000 yard performance of the 243 as opposed to 260 Remington and 308 Winchester? Well, I would rate the two, the performance of the 243 at 1,000 yards as much, much better than even the best 308s at that distance. A The 107 grain Sierra Match King that I run in the 243 is not the absolute best bullet. The 115 grain DTAC has a better ballistic coefficient and better ballistic performance when you're running it at 3,000 plus than the 107 grain Match King. The 107 grain Match King still puts a massive whooping on the 308, even if you're running 155 grain Lapua at 3,000, 3,100 foot per second. So there really is no comparison between the two. If you have the ability to run a smaller diameter, higher BC, faster bullet, you take it. Uh, that bullet will almost always perform better in the wind and better at longer ranges as far as drop than a fatter lower BC bullet at lower speed. Now the 243 and the 260 uh, they go back and forth there are trade-offs to both if you run a screaming fast 243 with a high BC bullet it's gonna have less drop than the 260 uh, wind drift starts to get really close between the two of them. The best way to look at that is to go through with a ballistic calculator and just start comparing different bullets because when you get in between those two, uh, bullet to bullet makes a big difference. Uh, but almost any of them are going to perform better than the high ballistic coefficient 308s because even a high BC 308 gets stomped by an average 243 or 260. So again, there's really no comparison. The big place, and I think some of our viewers may misunderstand me when I talk highly of the 243, it's the difference between a Formula One race car and, say, a Camaro. They're both high performance. You can both take them out and 
run on a racetrack with them. Uh, the difference is the Formula One car is really well suited for a specific type of competition. The Camaro is kind of a more all around thing. You can go race it on the drag strip, you can go take it on the oval, and then you can go get groceries with it. Uh, so the 308, kind of like the Camaro. Uh, if you have a new shooter, saddle them up with a 308. That way they're not burning barrels out before they even learn how to get behind the rifle or learn proper trigger pull and breathing. Um, it doesn't make sense to give a new driver a Formula One race car and say, here, go learn on this, because they're going to burn the tires out and blow the engine before they ever learn how to drive. So that's kind of why I recommend the 308 for new shooters, 243 or 260 for competition shooting. So I hope that's fairly clear. Ryan asks, how to read MOA scopes with mil dot reticles and a heads up on when we will get the bloody Tika T3 review. Uh, well, Ryan, we haven't locked anything on with uh, Beretta USA as far as getting a Tika for review yet. Um, I do want to work on that a little bit later this year. It may not be until after shot, so it may be beginning of next year before we get around to doing that. There are a couple of other rifles that we're also trying to get locked on for review, but I don't really want to speak on that just yet because sometimes those things pan out, sometimes they don't. Uh, we're not one of these massive uh, TV shows that I can just call people up and they're stumbling to send me stuff. Sometimes it takes a little work and a little uh, politics on our part to try to get some of the stuff that we get to review. So we are working on it. It is something that I hope to do. I'm not sure exactly which T3 variant that we're going to work on. Uh, it may be something like the T3 Sporter. It may be one of the T3 Varmints. Uh, but I really do want to get one of the T3s in. They're very nice rifles. I have shot them in the past. We just haven't been able to do any kind of serious accuracy review with them. All right, as far as your second part of the question, what you have to remember is 1 mil equals 3.44 MOA. Although in the field, it's kind of hard to remember 3.44 MOA, so you just need to remember that 1 mil approximately equals 3.5 minutes of angle. And that makes it fairly simple, two mil, seven minutes of angle, etc. Uh, that's gonna be close enough when you're looking through the scope to get the job done. So if you have a mixed mil and MOA turret type rifle scope, then what you can do is look through it. You fire a shot, you notice your shot impacted one mil low, you're gonna reach up and you're gonna dial three and a half minutes up on your turret. Same thing with the windage, you just need to break it down. Now, the gold standard of breaking down a mill reticle is really gonna be half a tenth. Uh, it's difficult to get down to half a tenth and start to do those fractions between mill and MOA. But if you're breaking it down to a tenth, then what you have to remember is if you see an impact is off or you wanna make an adjustment that's one tenth mill in your reticle, then that's going to be 0.35 MOA. And most of our scopes are only graduated in quarter MOA. So you would go, you would be somewhere between one click and one and a half clicks on your elevation on your MOA turret. Uh, it's a little bit cumbersome, but again, just remember approximately one mil to 3.5 MOA and go from there. This is one of the reasons, trying to teach this to a new shooter while they're trying to remember everything else is one of the reasons I say just go with a mill mill setup, mill reticle, mill turrets. Uh, we are now getting to the point where we have rifle scopes that are in the $500 range that have mill reticles and mill turrets. So you can get a relatively inexpensive scope that has the benefits of mill mill matching reticle and matching turrets. And you can go on from there. Uh, when you go to a mill reticle and mill turrets, you take the whole conversion thing out. You take most of the math out of it. There really is not a whole lot to remember. You don't have to remember conversion factors. You don't have to try to do math in the head. What you see is what you get. Jonathan asks, proper dry fire techniques and trigger follow through. And then Sean follows up with, would you please do a series showing the fundamentals on shooting the standard shooting positions? 
Well, Jonathan and Sean, if you noticed uh, this last week, we started with our Precision Rifle Skills Series. And hopefully, if not every week, every couple of weeks, we'll be posting a new episode to the Precision Rifle Skills Series. And we're going to take you through each step from not really knowing anything about how to shoot a precision rifle up to being able to engage long-range targets with the rifle. And it's going to take us a little while to get there. We're going to take baby steps as we go along. Our first episode that we published this last week is on the supported prone position, and it's how to get into a solid prone position with a bipod and rear bag. Uh, it takes you down step by step. And what we're trying to do as we go through these is we're going to try to give you the information. We're going to approach the subject matter so that you can take notes or if you have an iPod or an iPhone or iPad or something like that so you can take the episode out to the field with you and watch it and then see what you're doing and go through step by step, go through by the numbers. Or if you're at home, take notes and go down and go through it step by step. So we're really trying to orient it so that you can go to the range without an instructor and try to go through these skills. And we're gonna to try to put it in as simple a manner as possible so that you new shooters out there that have just picked up the precision rifle can get the job done. Um, we welcome any input on those episodes, so please go check out the Precision Rifle Skills Series, the Supported Prone episode, and leave any comments that you have on there. Uh, the next episode that we're going to do is going to be on breathing and trigger control. So once you get prone and breathing and trigger control, you ought to be to a point where you can get your rifle sighted in. Uh, you can do a couple of simple drills, and then we're going to try to go beyond there. And each episode is going to kind of build on the last. So you want to make sure that you go through and try to watch them in order. Well, that's all the time that we have for this Mail Call Mondays. If you've got any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you like the episode, please give us that thumbs up. Please share our videos far and wide so the widest audience gets the benefit of our content. If you're a subscriber, thank you very much. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And until next time. Get out and shoot!